Um, I'd like to welcome you to the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. Uh, actually, please excuse me, to the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. <laughs> and, um, and to our public lecture series. Um, many of you I know uh, come very often and we're very grateful and we hope that um, we can provide you with a lot of interesting uh, ideas and insights. Today the talk is on antimatter. I guess that's why the crowd is so large. So thank you very much. Uh, the speaker is Aaron Rudman, who is a, a faculty member, a professor at the laboratory. He's also a member of the Babar Collaboration, the big experiment that's been going on here for 10 years to measure the properties of antimatter. He's the discoverer of one of the uh, very elusive and tricky decay channels of the B meson, the decay to two pi, neutral pi mesons. Very hard thing to find and very rare. He's a contributor to the experimental techniques of the collaboration in very profound ways. And he's also, um, well, loves to talk about this stuff. So today he will tell you about matter and antimatter and what it is and where did it go. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> Thank you. In 1933, antimatter was discovered with this single picture. This is a picture from a cloud chamber taken by Carl Anderson at Caltech. In it, he saw the track of what appeared to be an electron. However, an electron would have bent to the right, and what he observed was a particle that bent to the left. This mysterious object was the first sign of antimatter. And this track is the, is the remnant of the antimatter version of the electron, a particle we call the positron. More remarkable, perhaps, is that the existence of this particle was predicted <coughs> to solve certain inconsistencies in quantum mechanics by Paul Dirac only three years earlier. For their work, both won the Nobel Prize. If we fast forward 20-some years, the antiproton was discovered at Berkeley by Chamberlain and Segre uh, at a large accelerator at the Berkeley lab. And this is the first measured view of the antimatter version of the proton. What's happening in this, in this picture is that up here is an accelerator that, in some complicated way, produces the antimatter version of the proton, the antiproton. And we see, in this picture, that particle coming in and ultimately comes to rest. And then what must have happened is that antimatter proton annihilated with a regular matter proton. That annihilation releases a huge amount of energy. That's E equals mc squared, in fact and produces nine, and uh, I think you can see them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's one here, eight, and there's a little one here, nine, nine new particles. And this is the first, the first view of the antiproton. And in fact, th this picture was not alone enough to establish the existence of this particle. In fact, they had to do a number of other studies. But with those studies, they concluded that they had discovered the antimatter version of the proton what we call the antiproton. Well, let's, very good. So let's, let, let me give you the answer to the first question in my title. What is antimatter? The best way I can answer that is to tell you that all fundamental particles, all elementary particles, such as the ones I hope you, you've learned about uh, in school, the electron, the electron, the proton, and the neutron, they all have an antimatter version. Our names for them are the positron, that's the antimatter version of the electron, then antiproton and antineutron. These antimatter particles are exactly the same as their matter versions, except they have the opposite electric charge. And you can think about the difference between matter and antimatter as a mirror. That's a common analogy we make, that 
there are the matter particles. And then if we look in a special kind of mirror, an abstract mirror, not the normal mirror that you look at your reflection in, but a mirror that changes matter and antimatter. If you look in that kind of abstract mirror, you see the electron turns into the positron. The proton turns into the antiproton. And I'll stop for one little note. Our, we like to write things in compact ways in physics. And our compact way of writing an antiparticle is to put a little bar on top. So when you see, uh, when you see this in the slides, remember the little bar means it's antimatter. There's also the antimatter version of the neutron. Now you may be asking, well, how does a neutron have an antimatter version? The neutron is neutral. So what does it mean to have the opposite electric charge? That doesn't make sense. In fact, the neutron is not a, a, a single particle. It's made up of three quarks. It has an internal structure. It has an, a quark we call the up quark. And it has two quarks that we call the down quark. And those particles do have a charge. The up quark has a charge of 2 thirds, and the down quark has a charge of minus a third. And so they balance and make a neutral particle. But then when we look in our antimatter mirror, we see that the charges of those constituents, the charges of the quarks, have flipped. It's still neutral, but inside the charges are actually different. It's really a different particle. So that's my answer to the first question. That's what it is. But now let's talk about where it is, what happened to it. If we look at the world around us, we see only matter. The Earth is made of only matter, only protons, neutrons, and electrons, not their antimatter versions, except for a tiny residual of antimatter. In certain radioactive processes, a little bit of antimatter is produced. In cosmic rays, those are particles, mainly protons, that come from outer space and are hitting the Earth at all times. Some antimatter is produced then. And we can make antimatter in our accelerators, like we do here at SLAC. But except for those sources, the whole Earth is matter. How about the moon? Well, if the moon had a lot of antimatter, if it was made of antimatter, the Apollo astronauts would uh, have come to a bad end, I'm afraid. Because when, we, when I mentioned before that an antiproton annihilates with a proton, that would happen both for an individual particle and for big masses of particles. And in fact, if you've, if you've heard of antimatter before in the show Star Trek, the antimatter drive, that's, there's actually a kernel of truth in that. If you had a big lump of antimatter, that is a very potent energy source. The problem, of course, is containing it. Because if it touched its walls, you would get a big explosion. So we know the moon is made of matter. We've touched it. What about the sun? Well, we see particles coming to us from the sun. All of those particles are matter particles, no antimatter. What about galaxies? There it's a little more complicated. But if there was a lot of antimatter in our galaxy, you would see the signs of the annihilation between the antimatter and the matter. And we don't see that. We don't see that anywhere in our galaxy. And if we look further afield, this is a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope, we don't see signs of antimatter uh, in the spaces between galaxies either. We would see again signs of annihilation between matter and antimatter, releasing a huge amount of energy and very distinctive phenomenon, and we don't see that. Now, of course, we can only see so far away, and past these very large distances, we, we just don't know. But as far as we can see, we do not see any signs of antimatter in the universe. And so we're left with the question, where did the antimatter go? If antimatter is just as good as matter, why is the whole universe made of just matter? Let me see if uh, I'll show you a little cartoon movie uh, with a picture of, of some of the features of the early universe to try to explain what might have happened. So if we imagine, and this is just a cartoon, we imagine very early in the universe, a minute after the Big Bang, there's a soup of matter and antimatter, the blue and the red, with pure energy, with light particles, which are the little arrows. But then the universe expands. I hope people know that. The universe is expanding and cooling down. And so the matter and antimatter is spreading apart and slowing down. And gradually what happens is that the 
the matter and antimatter annihilate each other. And that's the blue and the red dots disappearing until eventually you're left with just a tiny amount of matter and lots of energy. And that tiny amount of matter is everything we see in the universe. So to review it. So just after the Big Bang, the universe had to have, we, we have very good reasons for thinking, oops, had to have equal parts of matter and antimatter. Then, somehow, a tiny excess of matter of the size one part in 10 billion was created. And then, as the universe expanded, cooled down, all the particles moved more slowly, all of the antimatter annihilated with almost all the matter. And the tiny bit left, that's us. That's everything we see in the universe, is that tiny remnant. But the question is, how was that tiny excess created? So that's the topic of the talk in, in broadest brush. And we'll see what we've learned about this question. What must have been true is that early in the universe, a minute after the Big Bang, sometime in the first minute after the Big Bang, some interaction between particles, I'm going to call it in this lecture a force, a force between these elementary particles must have been a little bit different between matter and antimatter. And that produced the excess of matter. And so what we want to do is discover the force that caused that and understand how it, how it operates. So with that, let me just say a little bit about the fundamental forces, the forces that exist between elementary particles. There are four. The first one we call the strong force. That's the force that holds the three quarks together in a proton. It also holds protons and neutrons together in atomic nuclei. We've looked, and as far as we can see, this force is the same between matter and antimatter. We don't see any differences. The next force, and actually I'm going in order of strength. The strong force is the strongest force. The next force is electromagnetism. And we've looked there as well. And as far as we know, there's no difference between matter and antimatter for electromagnetism. What's the next force? The next force is something we call the weak force. And the weak force is responsible for certain radioactive decays. Now, I'm going to use this word decay a lot in the lecture. And so I want to define it precisely. Because the way we use it in particle physics is different, a little bit different than the common usage. It's not so far off, but somewhat different. What we mean by decay is when one particle disintegrates into two or more other, they have to be less massive particles. That's what we mean by a decay. And I'll use that, I'll use that word repeatedly in this talk. So the weak force is responsible for particles decaying. And we'll see that actually the weak force does have a way uh, to affect matter and antimatter differently. So that, that, too, will be the topic of much that we talk about today. There's one more force. Of course, it's the weakest force by far, and that is gravity. It may surprise you to know that gravity is actually very weak compared to any of these other forces, but it is. Now, the typical theories of our typical understanding of gravity uh, implies that there should not be a difference between matter and antimatter for gravity. But it's an interesting fact that that has not been experimentally tested. It's actually very difficult because gravity is so very weak to isolate just the force of gravity and see if it's the same for matter and antimatter. It doesn't help that antimatter is hard to make and hard to hold on to. So this has not been tested, although recently people have proposed doing experiments to test exactly that. OK, so let's, let's talk about the difference between matter and antimatter as seen in this weak force. In 1964, Jim Cronin and Val Fitch discovered that in the decay of a particle called the neutral, the neutral K meson, there was a difference between matter and antimatter. I'm going to tell you a little about that. The neutral kaon is, a, is an interesting particle. And I've, I've drawn it in this way, half blue and half red. And I, I, I think you'll see that my convention is that blue is antimatter. Red is matter. And this particle, it's 
the k on, it's neutral, that's the zero, and it's the special one that's long-lived. Long-lived means it lives for, uh, uh, let's see, it's a hundred millionth of a second. That's a long time. So this particle is neither matter or antimatter. It's some mixture of the two. It's both at the same time. Okay, and that has, that has some interesting properties, and we'll see that several times in this talk, that particles that are neither matter or antimatter are important for us. Now, it decays in a number of different ways. One of the ways it decays is this. And I'll, I'll, I'll warn you that I'll mention a lot of different elementary particles in this talk. Uh, there are lots of them. I'll only mention a fraction of the ones that exist. And I'll mention them as, as I need them. So don't be intimidated by all the Greek letters and the different particles. They're just different beasts in the particle zoo. And I'll, I'll try to describe the properties that are relevant as we go. So this neutral kaon decays to a particle called the pion. So this is the antimatter version of the pion. It decays to the positron, we've already seen that, and another particle called the neutrino. And it happens to decay to the matter version. It also decays the mirror way. So if you look in our antimatter mirror again, you see that all the particles have flipped. This neutral antimatter pion has turned into a matter positive pion the positron has turned into an electron, and this neutrino has changed as well. So that's the, we've got the regular version, or we've got one version and the antimatter version of it. And we can ask, how often does our friend the kaon uh, decay this way, and how often does it decay that way? And I, I should say that this decay happens by the weak force. Well, it turns out that the top the top one happens 1.0066 times more often than this one. So by a tiny, tiny amount, one of these versions of decay is favored. That is an example of what we call an asymmetry. It's something that's different for the antimatter version compared to the matter version. They're a little bit different. And that that's a sign that the weak force responsible for this decay is actually different between matter and antimatter. And again, it's this tiny amount. So the asymmetry, so this is the one equation in the talk. I'll, but I'll show this, this equation three or four times. Right? This is the only equation. It's so an asymmetry is this way minus that way divided by the sum. And it's not zero, it's 0.0033. If it were zero, we would say that matter and antimatter are the same. And if it's different than zero, well, there's an asymmetry. So with, with this measurement and actually some other measurements, we saw for the first time that matter and antimatter were different in some important way. And when this was discovered, there were a whole wealth of ideas presented to explain why that occurs. Many different ideas. Some involved new forces, besides the four we talked about. Some involved a particle called the Higgs, which uh, if you read the, the New York Times science section, you may have read about because we, we hope to find it at a, uh, an accelerator in Europe. Haven't found it yet. Okay, so people at the time proposed maybe the Higgs has something to do with this asymmetry. There were a lot of ideas, but none of them were very convincing. So let's look now in the story to see how the weak interaction, the weak force, makes a difference between matter and antimatter. And that will be very important because understanding how that happens will guide the experiment that we've built here at SLAC, the B factory, whose results I want to tell you about today. All right, so the first step, so we're going to, again, we're going to talk about how quarks decay by the weak force. And the first step happened in 1963 by an Italian physicist, Niccolo Cabibo who noticed that there was certain regularity in the way, oops, I didn't want to do that, too soon. Let's try again. Certain regularity in the way down quarks decayed to up quarks and the way strange quark decayed to up quarks. What he saw is that there was a connection, a relationship between these two apparently disparate decays and that all of the cases of decays of these particles obey that relationship. 
But that wasn't enough. What happened next is two Japanese physicists, Kobayashi and Moskawa, in 1973, said, OK, we can take that idea of a relationship in the way particles decay one big step further. If we hypothesize that there are three more quarks, the charm quark, this is what we call them today, the charm quark, the bottom quark, and the top quark, so that there are a total of six quarks, we assume that, it's a lot to assume, and that the way that they decay into each other obeys certain regular relationships, a matrix of relationships. If we assume those two things, not and there was no evidence in 1973 of either of them whatsoever. So this is a very bold prediction. If we assume those two things, then we can explain how the weak force makes a difference between matter and antimatter. This is a very bold uh, thing to predict. You know, there are only so many particles, and predicting new ones is difficult. Right? Difficult thing to do, especially predicting three. But in the intervening years, we have discovered the charm quark. That was discovered here at SLAC and in a laboratory on Long Island in 1974. And both the bottom and top quarks were discovered at the lab outside Chicago, Fermilab, uh, the bottom in the late 70s and the top in the mid 90s. So that was a good, it was actually a good prediction. They were right about that. And moreover, they predicted, as I said, certain relationships between the way the particles decay. They didn't predict exactly how often the, the case would happen. They didn't say, well, we know exactly how often a top quark will decay to a strange quark. What they said instead is that how often a top decays to a strange is related to how often a bottom quark decays into a charm quark. And those relationships have allowed us to make a number of important predictions. So, now uh, I'll use one piece of jargon in the talk, and that is, I'll show you that jargon, is that this whole picture, this theory about how the weak force works, I'm going to call the CKM model for the three guys, Kabibo, Kabibo Kobayashi, and Moskawa. So I'll say that a lot, CKM, CKM. So that's what it means. It means this theory. So this model or theory predicts relationships between the ways different quarks decay, and it predicts that there'll be a big matter-antimatter difference, an asymmetry, in decays of the B meson. What's the B meson? So here's another definition. The B meson, that's another, yet another particle. We ran out of Greek letters, so at some point we had to start using uh, regular letters. It's a particle that has a bottom quark, the B quark, and another quark. And it's, it's an up or a down quark, it turns out. So they predicted you'd see a large effect. Remember in the kaon, the size of the asymmetry was 0.0033, tiny. In this case, they predict that the asymmetry will be large, 0.7 or 0.8. So that sounds great, because it's a lot easier to measure a big effect than a small effect. And so what we have done over the last 15 years is to build an accelerator and a detector to make lots and lots of B mesons and to try to prove that the CKM model is correct. We wanted to discover matter-antimatter asymmetries in this particle, the B meson, and perhaps to show that the size, the value of that asymmetry, agrees with our prediction. Okay, so that's, that's what we're going to talk about today, too. But there's a problem. I just have to mention the problem. The problem is that this theory, this model, the CKM model of differences between matter and antimatter, cannot, unfortunately, explain why there's matter left in the universe. If the CKM model were the only way that forces were different between matter and antimatter, we would have one ten billionth of the amount of matter in the universe that we actually have. So it's not that the size of the asymmetry is small, it's really in the structure of the theory, the structure of the particle interactions. People have tried to devise clever models to get around this. They have not worked. And so to understand why there's matter left, so in, fa in fact, in that way, the title is a misnomer. So it's not really what happens to the antimatter. The title could have been, 
why is there any matter left at all? So what we'd like to do, if we can, is to find a matter-antimatter asymmetry using the B, the B particles, the B meson particles, that is different than our model. Okay? So maybe we'll find, so in fact, what are we going to find? The, the slack B factory was built to discover matter-antimatter asymmetries, and maybe two things could happen. Either we'd find asymmetries that agree with the CKM model, but then we'd have the problem, why is there matter left in the universe? Or maybe we'd find the asymmetries don't agree with the model, and maybe what we really find will point the way to understanding why there's matter in the universe. Or, of course, there's a third possibility, maybe somewhere in between. Uh, you'll see at the end of the talk what we've learned, which of these three possibilities it is. Okay. This is a nice animation. Since I can't take this big group to see the accelerator, this is a little animation showing you schematically what, is, uh, what goes under 280. This is the LINAC. This is the long two-mile accelerator under 280. We use it to accelerate electrons, and we use it to make positrons. We make antimatter uh, for use in the B factory. And then those particles are fed into that ring that you just saw. There are two rings going in opposite directions. And eventually, the electrons and the positrons collide. The two beams collide. We don't smash any atoms. We smash smaller particles. They collide. And they collide in the middle of the Babar detector. And you can see different drawings showing you pictures of the Babar detector. And then you make, actually you don't make one B meson. You make two. We make two at the same time. And this is an artist's conception of what happens afterwards. Those B mesons decay after around a trillionth of a second. And we see the particles they decay into with our detector, called the bar. And here at the end, you see a little view of the, of the B factory. Oh, it's gone. The B factory ring with the long LINAC, the, the long accelerator in the distance. So the slack B factory took thinking about this accelerator started in the late 80s. Um, it was approved. And I have to thank everyone here. It's your tax dollars at work that uh, went into this project. It was approved in 1994. It took four years to build. Uh, and it started operation in 1999. And we took data as much as we could until April 2008. And in April, we shut off. And to observe the decays of the B mesons, we built the Babar detector. We have the best mascot in particle physics by a long shot. And of course, Bavar is a good name because we make a B meson and the antimatter version, the B bar. So the name makes perfect sense, B and B bar, Bavar. Uh, actually, we got permission from the Bavar people to use the elephant. And so we like, we like the elephant. Uh, this is a picture of the Bavar detector. This is a one person, so you can get the scale of it. It's big. There are, there are bigger ones out there, but it's pretty big. And it has lots of apparatus designed to, um, to detect the decay of the B particles. And actually, someone pointed out, you can see on the walls there are some more. I think that's, that's exactly the same picture right there. There's another picture there uh, of some of the innards being worked on. Now, I've mentioned a few people, and so I want, uh, since this is the, it's the the home crowd. I, I want to mention a few others. One of the key ideas uh, behind the B factory, one I'm not going to tell you about, I'm afraid, but one of the key ideas was, uh, was from Pierre Adone. And that's Pierre there sitting. This is the B factory uh, itself. And then Jonathan Dorfin, there's Jonathan, is really the person who got the B factory built. If you had to say one single person, it would be him. He led the B factory project for many years. The team of people who built and operated the B factory is this group led by John Seaman. And then the group that built and analyzed the data from the Babar detector is this fantastic collection here. And this isn't even everybody. Okay? It's a big group. And at its peak, had a, almost 600 physicists from around the world. And I think I have a few colleagues in the audience today. And you should always wear a red shirt on picture day, because then you can find yourself. Okay. So, so it takes a huge team to, to, uh, to build, to operate, 
to study the data in one of these experiments. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about how we measure a matter-antimatter asymmetry. There, there are a couple different ways we do it. One way is the way I already showed you for the K-on, but that's not the main way. So I want to tell you about the main way we do it. And there are three facts you have to know. I'm going to tell you the three facts. Fact one, a particle like the B meson has an exponential decay. What does that mean? If you had 1,000 B mesons in the first tenth of a picosecond, so a trillionth of a second, uh, you might have around 60 of those B mesons decaying. But then if you looked one half-life later at one picosecond, you'd have half as many decaying. And a picosecond later, you'd have half as many of that. And a case when things go down by halves is we call an exponential decay. You may, have, you may remember that from high school math. If you don't, I just hope you'll accept it. So if we look at the decays as a function of time in this great unit picosecond, again, that's a trillionth of a second. A trillionth of a second is actually not so hard to measure, it turns out. Uh, you get this curve. So that's fact number one. Fact number two, cool fact number two, is that a matter B meson, here's the way I'll draw it, so it's, it's neutral, so I've got the zero, and it's red, so it's matter. A matter B meson can just change instantly into an antimatter B meson. It just happens. It's, it's due to the weak force, but it just happens. Likewise, the antimatter B meson can all of a sudden just change into a matter version. They can go back and forth. Now, it's not completely random. There's some regularity to how it occurs, but they can do it. That's cool fact two. Now, important fact three is that sometimes you can get the following occurrence. You could have a matter B meson decay into a combination of particles that's neither matter or antimatter. So I said I was going to introduce lots of Greek letters. Here's another one, the psi. This is actually its nickname. Some people call it the J psi. It was discovered here at SLAC. It won its discoveries the Nobel Prize about a year and a half later, so it was a big deal. So the B can decay into this psi and a neutral kaon. And instead of the long-lived one, this is the short-lived. Don't worry too much about that. The key is, again, it's the whole combination is neither matter or antimatter. It's some of each. That's one thing that can happen. But another thing could happen. And the other thing that can happen is that matter B meson could first change into the antimatter version. And then that guy could decay into the same set of particles. Okay. If that happens, there are two paths. And when you have two paths that something can occur, you can get a phenomenon called interference. You might have encountered interference, uh, not with particles, maybe with sound. If you listen to two tuning forks with a sound that's very close, you might hear a beat frequency. So those of you that are musicians uh, may be familiar with that. And there are a number of other phenomenon of interference. All that happen when there are two ways to get from the beginning to the end. And so I want to show you a little demonstration. Let's see. Let's look at it here. I want to show you a little demonstration. It doesn't have anything to do with antimatter, but has everything to do with the interference when you have two paths. So the demonstration I'm going to show you is something called the Michelson interferometer. Uh, it was actually uh, very important in discovering that the speed of light was a constant. Uh, and it has, it, it, we have a little one right here. And we're going to take a laser and shine it on this slab of glass, which is sort of half a mirror. Half of, the to, half of the light will go this way on path one, and half will just go straight through on path two. In each of these paths, we'll put a mirror to bounce the light back, bounce the light back. And then some of this light will go straight, and some of this light will bounce. And so the light will get out here by two paths. Here's path one, here's path two. And we'll get an interference pattern. And I, I think this is really, so 
This doesn't have anything to do with antimatter per se, but it's an, an, an analogy to show you what happens when you have two paths, the way things can interfere. So let's, let's turn on, so some luck it'll just work right off the bat. Turn on the laser. Turn off that. Oh yeah, we're good. Okay, turn off the lights. Okay. So, there are a lot of people, so things are bouncing. But in this little gizmo down here, I've got those, those two mirrors, and they're the two paths. And you can see on the wall a pattern. Everyone stay really still. As you can see, it's bouncing around. Okay? Let's see. So what you see is there are alternating light and dark regions. And that's the interference. Can people see that? Okay. So when, it's, when you're on a light region, and you can see when it bounces, then the, the interference is ruined. Um, on a light region, that's when the two paths coincide and add, and it's light. And when they coincide and cancel, that's dark. And that's the dark. We call these fringes. And this is a nice example, it's a nice analog of interference. Okay. So if people want to, maybe afterwards we can, we can look at that a little more if people are interested after the question and answer period. But uh, let, me, let me turn on the projector. And then I'm going to turn on a little bit of the light. And we'll turn the laser off. Okay. So that's... That's our analog of this process of interference. There are other examples of interference. And I should say that if, if people have read a little bit about quantum mechanics, you may have heard people talk about going from a wave description to a particle description. The quantum mechanics mixes the two. Our example with light, with the laser, you can think of as the wave version. But what we see with the two paths, these two paths, so remember this path, and that path is the particle version. And so, here we get to the crux of the matter. If matter and antimatter are the same, then it doesn't, we don't care whether it's this process, this path, or that path. Since if any matter and matter are the same, they, there's no way they can interfere with each other, because they're the same. And when you look at the decay, of your B mesons, that decay will have the same exponential shape I told you about in fact one. But if matter and antimatter are different, then the two paths will interfere, and they can interfere to have fewer decays. That would be the red curve. So instead of the exponential decay, you get a non-exponential decay with fewer decays. The analog here is the dark fringes. This is the case where the two paths cancel. And instead of a dark fringe, a dark, a dark pattern, instead of that, we get fewer decays. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but here, right, you get the same number of decays. And as you go along in time now, not in the space, not in distance that we saw on the screen, but in time, you get Fewer, you get a bigger difference here, fewer decays, it gets darker, and eventually out here, you can barely see it, but it actually, the red curve goes above the black curve, and you start to get more decays. And that would be like the, the light, the, the light region, the light fringe. Also, if you flip this whole process in the mirror, in our antimatter mirror, and you start with antimatter, and the paths differ, then you get more decays than in the exponential case. That's like the light, the bright, the bright region. So we have the bright region and the dark region. And the size of the difference is our asymmetry. It's the size of the difference between matter and antimatter. So that's what we're looking for. That's what we've built all this stuff to do, to look for exactly this effect. What did we find? So remind you, the prediction of the CKM model for this asymmetry 
was between 0.7 and 0.8. These are more exact numbers. This is what we saw. After nine years of taking data, collecting almost a billion B mesons, some small fraction, uh, about 6,000, decay in the way that we want here. So even though we're looking for a big asymmetry, it's hard to do because the B meson uh, doesn't always decay the way you want it. After all that, this is what we see. Here's the case where we start with antimatter and we have this number of decays as a function of time. But when we start with matter, when, it's, when we start with a matter B meson, we have this pattern and you can see very clearly the difference. And the exponential case would be exactly in between the two of them. Now, often to look at this effect better, we'll form the asymmetry. We'll subtract the blue minus the red and divide by their sum. So again, that's the one equation. And this is the curve you get. So here's our equation, same equation. The number of times uh, when you start as a B bar, the antimatter version, versus the number of times when you start as the matter version, here's that difference over the sum and you can see very clearly that asymmetry. What do we find numerically? We find that asymmetry is 0.69 with an uncertainty of only 0.03. It took us 10 years almost to measure it this well. That's extremely well measured. And you can see it does agree quite well with the predictions uh, from the CKM model. So we should celebrate. We have celebrated. And in fact, earlier this month, K and M, Kobayashi and Moskawa, of the CKM model were awarded the <laughs> 2008 Nobel Prize in Physics. And although uh, there is actually some controversy about Kabibo, why didn't Kabibo get a share? Kobayashi and Moskawa won half the prize. The other half of the prize went to uh, um, a physicist at the University of Chicago for sort of related work, but not really the same. And so plenty of people have, have wondered, why didn't Kabibo get the prize? So uh, us physicists can argue a lot about such things. And if you look at the Nobel Committee's citation for the prize, they said, the prize is for the discovery of the origin of the broken symmetry. Broken means it's an asymmetry. So it's not symmetric, it's asymmetric. Which predicts the existence of at least three families. A family is a pair of quarks. So three families. Two quarks in each family is six quarks in nature. And of course, that's what we see. We see six quarks in nature. They also went on to say the two particle detectors, Babar at Stanford and Bell in Scuba, Japan, we have competitors. There's actually a B factory in Japan, very similar B factory that's gotten results in this case that agree perfectly. Both detected broken symmetries independently of each other. The results were exactly as Kobayashi and Moskawa had predicted almost three decades earlier. So I feel, I think as many of my uh, collaborators on the bar feel, that this Nobel Prize is one that we had something to do with. So we feel good about it too. Now, that's not the end of the story. We have so many, we have almost a billion B mesons, and there's not just this one way that we can look for differences between matter and antimatter. There are many ways. I'm going to tell you about two more of them. So, let me remind you one thing. We think the C we now believe the CKM model is is demonstrated. We think it's true. It's a, the right description of the weak force. But remember, there's a problem. We still don't understand why there's any matter left in the universe. I said before the CKM model can't explain that. So we've understood the, how the weak force produces a difference between matter and antimatter. But we don't understand why the universe has so much matter in it. So it's worth looking for something else. Maybe we can find, maybe it's that middle case. We've shown the CKM model is right, but maybe we can find something else that's new. One way that we do that is to look, instead of before it was the psi and this k short, we could also look for a different particle called the phi and a k short. Again, it's just another particle. But in this case, so when it's the psi, 
the CKM model has a big effect, and this is a very popular decay mode. It happens a lot. This decay mode with a phi is much rarer. It's about 20 times rarer. It's harder for the bead to decay that way. I've drawn it with a littler box. So we, we think now the CK model is right. So certainly the CK model is going to affect any matter-antimatter asymmetries we see in this other decay. But maybe there's something new. And if there's something new, it's probably small. And if, it, if there's something new that's small, it'd be swamped by the effect in this decay. But if we look at a rarer, smaller decay, maybe the something new will have a bigger fractional effect. And it turns out looking with this decay, the phi and the kaon, is a good way to search for something new. It's not the only way. There are actually several different decays of this sort. But this is the one I want to tell you about. And if the CK model were right, then we would see the same size effect with the phi as we do with the psi. So again, the prediction would be between 0.69 and 0.84. What do we see? We see an asymmetry of 0.26 with an uncertainty, unfortunately, of 0.26. <laughs> it just is, it's happenstance that those are the same. Uh, but what's important is that this, this number is, is too big, and you can't tell whether this 0.26 is the same as that or different. It's a little bit different, but does it mean anything? We don't know. We don't know. It's not accurate enough. And the conclusion, unfortunately, even after 10 years of work, the conclusion is that um, you need more data. So we don't know whether there's something different here. Now, there are other decays of this sort where there's a little bit more uh, data. There are, it's a more popular decay. And so far, we don't see any evidence of something new in those. But you, you couldn't argue that there isn't something. And, and we think that maybe there is something new to be found. And the fact that we don't understand why there's so much matter is one of the clues, one of the reasons to keep searching. I want to tell you about one more, one more decay, one more case of looking for asymmetries. And that's with this decay. It's, uh, if we start with the antimatter B, it could decay to, this is the same K on, but now it's a neutral version. So the antimatter version, plus a pi on, that's the matter version. But the decay could happen in the mirror version. So again, we're going to have our, we have our antimatter mirror. It can happen in the mirror where we switched all the reds and the blues, matter and antimatter. It could happen either way. And we look for this decay. We see quite a few of them. This is, a, this is a plot that shows you the energy of these Bs. And the real B should be right here with some distribution. We shouldn't have anything out here, and we don't. And you can see the red is the number of B decays we have when it's this way. And the blue is the number when it's that way. And you can see by eye that there's a big difference between the two. So if you take the number of those minus the number of those divided by the sum, so again, our asymmetry equation, you get minus 0.107 with an uncertainty of 0.017. So that uncertainty is small enough that it's very clear there's yet another matter-antimatter difference. This one is actually completely different than the one I told you about with the, the psi and the k on and the k short. This is a different effect. So we can ask, what does the CKM model predict for this case? And my personal feeling is that the CKM model does not make a reliable prediction in this case. Now, this is actually an, an, an area of active research. Some of my colleagues completely disagree with this. And they argue that this measurement, coupled with, some, with other measurements of similar decays actually indicates that there is something new that is outside of the CKM model. But other of my colleagues think that the, the first group don't know what they're talking about and that, in reality, you can't make any reliable predictions. So in some sense, I have to say, and uh, it's interesting, in particle physics, there are two groups. There are experimentalists who 
build experiments, take data, make measurements. And there's another group, theorists, who calculate the implications of certain theories, or in the case of Kobayashi Muskawa, make up new theories. This is one case where I think the experimenters have done their job, but the theorists have not held up their end of the bargain. Now, in their defense, this is a very difficult thing to calculate. So, but unfortunately, we, we just don't know. We just don't know right now. But it could be an indication of something new. With that, I think I'm going to conclude. So, we've seen matter-antimatter asymmetries in the B. We've, uh, this is really a huge accomplishment. And we've shown that the CKM model is correct. It describes the, the effects, the asymmetries we've seen, and it describes how the weak force operates. We've seen many additional asymmetries, but unfortunately, the, the reason why there's so much matter in the universe, I think we do not have extra insight into. We still don't know. What are we going to do? What, what next? Well, there's a new accelerator in Geneva, Switzerland, at the lab called CERN. And one of those experiments is going to make a lot of B mesons. And they hope to continue this work using somewhat different techniques but searching again for a new asymmetry. And also, other of my colleagues working both in Japan and in Italy are working towards building what has been dubbed a super bee factory, a bee factory that would produce 100 times uh, more bee mesons than the current ones do. And, with, and so it's very possible in either this experiment, which is starting now, or one of these future projects, we'll be able to get some insight into why there's so much matter in the universe. And with that, I thank you. So I'm sure you folks have some questions. We're happy to take some questions. Um, sir. Okay, so the question that people couldn't hear is, how do you know whether it starts out as a matter B meson or an antimatter B meson? So, uh, I left out a few things in this talk. And one of the things <laughs> I left out is that, or maybe I mentioned it tangentially, we make two B mesons. We make a matter B meson and an antimatter B meson. And one of the B mesons will decay this way to a, a psi and a kaon, or a phi and a kaon. The other one will do something else. We look at the other one and see whether it was a matter or an antimatter version. And that, we know that at, at any given point in time, you have one of each. And that, that's how we do it. That's how we do it. Well, it, you, you can't compare, at the Large Hadron Collider, you can't compare exactly because the way the particles are created is different. And uh, they'll make more B mesons, but some things they'll do will not be as good. In fact, the thing I just mentioned, uh, using the other B meson to tell you something about the one you're interested in, that doesn't work nearly, that works a factor of 10 worse in their case. But they might be able to make 50 or 100 times more part B mesons. So they, they have a, there'll be a lot of capabilities there. How long are you doing something like, I don't know, in a day or in a uh, Let's see. Well, it's, it's, so how many do you make? So we made, it, we made almost a billion in nine years. And they will make, let's, let's call it 50 times more than that in a given amount of time. But they won't be as useful. That's the best way I can answer it. <laughs> this, let's see this question there. No, it, it doesn't matter whether they're near each other. What matter, so for an individual particle, it's random. 
But if you have lots of them, they obey certain, uh, certain trends. And the trend they obey is, in fact, you can see it. Uh, let's see. The, the trend they obey is sinusoidal. And if I click a couple more times, there. So the trend that they obey when they oscillate is, is similar to this one. And this is actually a sine curve, right? The same sine curve you learned about in trigonometry. So on average, they obey a sine or a cosine in time. But for any individual one, it's random, just like many processes are random in quantum mechanics. No, no, afraid not. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Wait. This fellow in the white shirt oh. has been very patient. Okay, yes. Okay, so the question is, what's the difference between a neutrino and an antineutrino? The difference is, uh, I think the best way to say it is the neutrinos, when neutrinos appear, they appear with an electron or with another particle called a muon. They always appear in concert with those. So the neutrino that appears with an electron is a different particle than the neutrino that appears with a positron. The difference isn't the charge, and this is one of the things that I think I, I uh, you know, I generalized perhaps too much. There are other charges besides electric charge, and there are more abstract charges, and those change. That's probably the best way to explain it. Um, those guys over there, here. I think. Well, so the question is, is the CKM model too simplistic? Now, or could there be more quarks? Well, th those, there are two different questions. People do hypothesize that there are extra quarks and look at the implications that would have. There is one, uh, one of my colleagues who is very fond of pictures where there are more quarks, and he claims that you can explain uh, the the small differences we saw with the phi, and can explain why the universe has matter in it just by hypothesizing one extra quark. Okay, no one else believes that's right, but he thinks so. Okay, <laughs> and you know it's an interesting. It's an interest. Those papers are very interesting. So that's something people work on. Now the other thing uh, that is interesting is that you'll notice that this value is on the lower end of this range. And some other of my colleagues are making a great deal of uh, a fuss about that difference. And it's possible that that indicates that there is a small problem or a small opportunity that it's the first sign that something is a little bit different. But I have to say the problem, the problem with that, in turn, is that this uncertainty is very well determined. Okay? We know wh what this means is that we think we are 68% sure that the real answer lies between 0.66 and 0.72. Right? So that's a statistical statement we can make. This range involves many different measurements and a number of different calculations. Again, the kind of difficult calculations that I alluded to before. It involves many of those put together with some complicated statistical model. And how much you trust the size of that range other people argue a huge amount about. So, okay. um, these two kids over there. Yeah. So, so I have two questions. First of all, what is a neutrino? And second of all, you said that there are some particles that are like a combination of matter and antimatter. So why don't those just explode before they get killed? Oh, okay. I, I'll answer the second question uh, first. I like that one. So the question is, if a particle's matter and antimatter, why doesn't it explode? The reason. Well, sometimes it does, actually. Sometimes it does. The, um, there are certain decays that are not by the weak force. You can decay also by the strong force or by the electromagnetic force. And that's exactly what happens 
when a proton and an antiproton annihilate. Okay? So I think the answer is yes, it, it, it can annihilate itself and it decays. Right? The first question, what is a neutrino? Uh, the neutrino is a very, very light particle. That's sort of the partner of the electron or another particle called the muon or a third one called the tau. And you know, when people ask what is a certain particle, it's actually kind of a hard question to answer. You know, if you say what is a chair, well, you can say, well, it's something you sit on. But for an electron, the only way to describe it is by its properties. How heavy is it? What's its mass? What's its electric charge? How does it interact by the four forces? That's as, that's as much as we can do. So I could list all those things for a neutrino, and that's, that's as much as you can say about what it is. Okay, I think uh, this young fellow right here. Okay, good question. You may, you may be familiar with Einstein's equation E equals mc squared. And what that equation tells us is that matter can turn into energy. Okay, so the m is the matter and the e is the energy. The c is the speed of light. So when the particles annihilate, quite a lot of their matter, or their mass, okay, the m, gets turned into energy. And so, you know, it's not quite true that energy can't be created or destroyed. It's really that the combination of energy and matter, energy and mass, can't be created or destroyed. So that's a good question. Put in the back. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, would anti, an antiproton and a positron make antihydrogen? The answer is yes, and in fact, uh, antihydrogen has been observed at both the lab in Switzerland, and I think also at Fermilab they managed to do it. It's very difficult. Antiprotons are hard to make, but you can make them, and it's hard to slow them down without them annihilating, but you can do it, and some tiny fraction of the time it can latch on to a positron make antihydrogen. And so that, that, if you wanted to see how does the force of gravity affect antimatter, that's the next step. If you can make antihydrogen and hold on to it and watch it either fall or maybe it goes up, probably not, but it probably falls, <laughs> but you want to see, that's how you do it. So that's actually, that's, that's the case where people are searching for, uh, for how uh, matter and antimatter are different with gravity. This young fellow here. Yes. So the question is: Is there another kind of mirror that can do the same thing with energy? Maybe not energy. But there is another kind of mirror that people are very interested in. It's not between matter and antimatter. It's between all the particles we know about and, their, uh, and, and different versions of them that have a property called spin. You may not know what spin is, but it's like something spinning around. So people think there may be a different matter that changes the spin of particles. In fact, Michael is one of the leading proponents of that theory. And many people hope that at the new accelerator in Switzerland, people will observe those, this different kind of mirror, particles that are a result of this different kind of mirror. That would revolutionize our understanding of, uh, of the world if those particles exist. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what antigravity is. So. We, we, you know, there's just gravity as far as we can see. Now, uh, gravity on antimatter, I don't personally, but uh, there are people uh, both at the lab outside of Chicago, Fermi Lab, and at the lab in Switzerland who are interested in that. Who's, who's been holding their hands? Wait, they're all new. So okay. It's fine. All right.
So the question is about the Higgs. So the, the Higgs is a big deal. Now the Higgs doesn't, we think, doesn't have anything to do with the matter-antimatter differences I've talked about today. But the Higgs is a particle that has an important role to play in the mass of all other particles. And so it's, it's in some sense, it's the one thing that we're almost sure exists that we haven't seen yet. We've seen all the other particles we expect. So it'll be a big deal if it's there and we find it. It'll be an even bigger deal if we don't find it. How about Bernie? So the question is what, you're asking about this one. So the question is what, where does this uncertainty come from? So I think I said when I described the CKM model that the, that model didn't predict the strength of the force between a top and a bottom or a top and a strange. It just told you about the relationships between them. When we use those relationships and we take many different measurements of other weak force observations, we use the CKM model and putting it all together uh, we see that it's consistent and that we infer that this asymmetry will have this value. The problem is that some of the measurements are very hard and some of the calculations are even harder and they just cannot be done perfectly well. And there's some range of uncertainty in all of those things. And when we put it together, we get this kind of uncertainty. This has taken, to get to this level has also taken, you know, the last 30 years. If you, if you asked what was this range 15 years ago, it was much, much broader. Okay. So, so, oh. Well, you can, yes. You can, you can go backwards, yes. Good. Bernie. So the question is, do the particles have different energies? Um, I mean, in some cases, yes, in some cases, no. One nice thing about making the B meson and the antimatter version of the B meson is that when they're created, they have very little energy, and they roughly have the same amount of energy. And that fact is very useful when we search for those decays. But in other cases, they have different energy. The energy itself doesn't affect the matter-antimatter asymmetry. So I okay, think so... Um, it's, the hour is getting late. There are some goodies outside. Um, let's take one more question, and then Aaron and I and other members of the Babar collaboration will be around here if you want to ask us questions privately. So one more, please. I'll take the kid. There's a uh, this oh, one sorry, over there. Sorry, sorry. Okay, y young fellow over here. So the question is, could you make an antimatter, could you make a big thing out of antimatter? So th the answer is yes. There's nothing that prevents it. But the problem is when we make a little bit of antimatter in our accelerator, we are making a tiny, tiny amount of stuff. Uh, unbelievably small amount of stuff. You could never see it with your own eyes. It's so difficult to make. In fact, in some ways, Antiprotons are the most expensive thing on Earth. If you calculate <laughs> how much money and uh, electrical energy it takes to make them, they are so much more expensive than anything else. So there's nothing to prevent it, but it would be very expensive. So, <laughs> so on that note, let's go.